thank you all for coming, whether it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, you're very much welcome. And uh, you're joining us at the uh, Urban Studies Annual Lecture. Uh, Urban Studies Journal uh, has been uh, in existence for over 50 years, but it's only relatively recently in 2015 that we determined to have an annual lecture series. And uh, since that time, we've had Elvin Wiley, Jamie Peck, Lily Kong, Robert Sampson, Abdul Malik Simone, and Sharon Zukin uh, deliver lectures. And you will be able to find all these lectures on our website, and they remain open access. Uh, our lectures enable leading scholars to, to speak to whatever theme they determine to be key at the moment. And the articles that they generate from that time are not restricted as normal articles are, uh, as we all face frustrations of making sure we get something to word length. We provide the opportunity for our speakers to uh, have a greater flexibility. And we've been delighted with the contributions we've had so far. I'm especially delighted to have eventually uh, convinced Ed Glazer to uh, deliver a lecture uh, for us. Uh, all of you will know uh, Ed, but please let me provide a brief introduction. He is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics uh, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. Uh, he has served as the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and director of the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. You will know he has published uh, dozens of manuscripts on cities, economic growth, law and economics. And his work in particular is focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers of idea transmission. He has published multiple books on the subject, and uh, I'm aware that he is planning, I think very shortly, to publish Survival of the City, Mass Flourishing in an Age of Social Isolation. Uh, or I don't know whether that is already out, Ed, or whether that's just due to come. But at, at that, I will hand over to you. Um, I would like uh, people to, uh, as we're going through to offer questions, if you can type them into the comments box, then I can save these until Ed has finished. Uh, thank you very much and best wishes, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, I'm uh, deeply honored, of course, and uh, I'm grateful that all of you have chosen to give me uh, you know, an hour and 20 minutes on your uh, on your Saturday to um, discuss the survival of the city, to discuss the future of the city. The book is not out. It will be out uh, September 7th, um, and it is a uh, jointly authored with David Cutler, my uh, long-term colleague uh, on matters relating to uh, health and cities, health segregation in cities. So this is of course an enormously uh, momentous time for cities. It's a, it's a period in which the sort of city has never before felt like it's under such stress. Um, in fact, it probably has been under greater stress. It probably was under greater stress in the 1970s, but it certainly feels like a moment of incredible uncertainty. Um, because if, after all, cities are the absence of physical space between people, then the isolation that almost all of us have undergone over the past years has essentially been a rapid fire de-urbanization of our world. And the question, of course, is what comes next? But before getting to that, uh, let me start with a little bit of an arc. So if I were giving this lecture in 2019, um, I probably would have started with a picture like this and talked about how tremendously vibrant and successful cities are. Here you have the 1,114 nuts three regions in the European Union, and they've been ordered on the basis of their density level. Each dot is a 10th of them. And the blue line shows the increase in GDP per capita associated with density. So the densest 10th of these regions have incomes that are twice as high as the least dense 10th. The red line shows population change between 2000 and 2010 and initial population density. And here again, we see instead of uh, people leaving crowded areas, people clustering in, people coming to be close to one another, which reflects both the productivity of cities, but also the pleasure that comes from being around other human beings. Um, 
I might have shown you graphs like these, which show the relationship between population size and productivity in the US, Brazil, China, and India. Uh, agglomeration economies are seen virtually everywhere we look for them. And they're particularly strong in the developing world where you know, urbanization is providing a pathway out of poverty into prosperity, albeit one that is messy, albeit one that is unequal, but there is no future in rural poverty. Um, and I might have also showed a graph like this, which shows the happiness gaps between urban and rural parts of different countries. This data is somewhat old. Um, and I've shown the relationship between that and income. And what you're supposed to take away from this graph is that in the wealthy parts of the world, uh, there is not a lot of gap between urban and rural happiness. Some places like Sweden and Finland, the urbanites are happier. Some places like Italy and New Zealand, the rural dwellers are happier. But if you go to the poorest places in the world, you go to India, Ghana, Moldova, Mali, Rwanda, South Africa, Guatemala, in these places, there's a very substantial happiness gap and it favors cities, okay? So as difficult as life in a Mumbai slum may be, uh, it is you know, still far better than life in, in rural India, at least as rated by life satisfaction here. There are two outliers, of course, on this. Iraq, I, I recall that this is still 2005 to 2007 data when Iraq's cities were still being bombed. And Thailand, I blame that one on the traffic jams in Bangkok. Now, that sort of very positive view of cities then runs into the reappearance of pandemic. Now, it has always been true that there are demons that come with density. Uh, there's traffic congestion, there's crime, there's high housing costs, but the most terrible of the demons that come with density is contagious disease. It has been a long partner of urbanization. This image uh, is often used to connote the plague of Athens, which struck that city in 430 BCE. Um, it's not actually, it's a painting by Nicolas Poussin of a biblical plague, but it does somewhat capture the classical vibe, if you will. Uh, the plague of Athens has, its background, of course, is this amazing period where Athens was doing all that you could possibly want a city to do. Athens of the fifth century is the city uh, where history is created by Herodotus and then Thucydides, who was an eyewitness to the pandemic and wrote about it lengthily. Uh, it's the place that gave us democracy. Pericles was the first among equals in, in the Athenian democracy, and he was the leader at the, at the start of the plague. He was also killed by the plague. The city gave us philosophy, it gave us math, it gave us drama, uh, it gave us architectural beauty. All of these things were gifts of the collaborative creativity that, that flourished in Athens. And yet that same density that was so magical also proved an enormous vulnerability. Now the immediate backstory for the plague of Athens was that Athens was at war with Sparta. Pericles' cunning strategy was that he was gonna, gonna summon the Athenians behind the walls of the city. Those walls were meant to protect the Athenians against the Spartan hoplites, and Pericles would send out the Athenian fleet to harass the Peloponnesian coast. A perfectly sound strategy militarily, the walls did hold up against the hoplites, um, and the fleet did go forth. But while the walls could keep out soldiers, they couldn't keep out bacteria. And a plague entered Athens through its port of Piraeus and laid waste to the city. Thucydides claims the plague comes from Ethiopia, but it's just as likely that it came from Asia. And apparently about one fourth of the population died within two years. It was utter chaos according to the Thucydides. People acted as if every day was their last day and all of urban order broke down. And in some sense, Athens never recovered. 25 years later, they would eventually lose to Sparta in the Peloponnesian War and the glory days of the city were done, snuffed out by a plague. The moral of this, of course, is that there are two features of cities that makes them vulnerable. One of which is they are nodes on the global network of trade and travel. The second of it, which is they are highly dense areas and plagues move rapidly from person to person. Both of these things make cities vulnerable in Athens and 2,400 years ago and in cities today. Perhaps the most devastating plague struck Constantinople in 500 and 41 BC, 541 AD, about a thousand years later. That's commonly called Justinian's plague. It's the first appearance of Yersinia pestis, the Black Death on European shores. And it proves so devastating because the future of European history hinged on the edge of a knife, right? The fifth century was a century in which the Western Roman Empire had, been, had fallen, been overtaken by uh, outsiders who, who had invaded and conquered. Um, but the 
Roman Empire persisted, it persisted in a strong way in Constantinople, and we were at a point of history in which it seemed possible that Justinian could send out his great warlord Belisarius and reimpose the Pax Romana on the on the Mediterranean world. Right? We could have had you know five centuries of, of growth that followed that rather than five centuries of darkness. And yet the plague came, the plague laid waste to the city. It was already in a vulnerable situation. And the key point, I think, which is central for thinking about our world today, is how vulnerable are we to this plague? How strong are our cities in terms of their ability to rebound? Every natural disaster is mediated by the strength of civic society at the time it strikes, right? When an earthquake hits Haiti, it does vastly more damage when it, than when an earthquake hits Chile in the same year. Are we more like the 19th century when our cities remained remarkably robust to pandemics or are we closer to Constantinople 541 AD? All right, now for the past 700 years, past 650 years, cities have been remarkably robust to the strike of, striking of different plagues, right? The, uh, the Black Death itself, which came in 1350 to Europe, laid utter waste to the population, but ended up creating a more urban world, partially by leaving behind a, a, a Europe that was wealthier, a Europe where there was more land per capita and hence a world that was richer and more willing to pay for the luxury goods that were produced in cities. The 19th century, was a great century of urban pandemic, right? This shows the path of death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. You can see the early decades of the 19th century were the era of yellow fever, a pandemic probably coming originally out of Africa, carried through the Caribbean up to the ports of the Eastern uh, United States, appearing and reappearing year after year and doing a great deal of damage. Then the middle decades were the years of cholera, emerges in the Ganges Delta in 1817, travels throughout the British Empire, overland to Russia, and eventually to the New World. Uh, absolutely devastating. Cholera uh, was actually fought uh, by providing clean water, by providing uh, sewers, because of course it's a great waterborne disease. Interestingly, the fight against cholera was based not on medical knowledge, but on a medical mistake. There were two great schools of disease in the early 19th century, one of which was the miasma school, which credited foul airs, right, fetid waters, and the other of which was the contagion school. Now, in fact, medically, the contagious school was right, but the only thing they could offer was quarantine, was isolation, which actually doesn't do that much good once the water is already polluted or once the mosquitoes are already there. Instead, the miasma school said, let's drain the swamps. Let's get the water out. Let's get rid of the things which create bad air, which turned out to be fairly effective against yellow fever because you got rid of the water, the standing water that housed the mosquitoes and very effective against cholera. You can see there the cholera, the Croton Aqueduct is opened in 1842. But interestingly, despite the fact that I was reared on this tale of engineering triumphalism, that New York was a terrible place until the aqueduct came in and then the fresh water flowed and it was great and everything was healthy, that's not what the time series looks like. For 25 years after the Croton Aqueduct, cholera continues to strike New York. In fact, my great-great-great-great-grandfather died in the 1849 cholera epidemic. It's not until 1866 when the Board of Health comes in, led by the redoubtable Dr. Stephen Smith, that you start seeing death rates go down from cholera. And the reason is that New York in the mid-19th century, just like Sub-Saharan Africa today, suffers from a last mile problem. The clean water was there. There were even free hydrants where you could get water, but relatively few of them for the entire city. And so poor people were unwilling to pay for the connection. They were unwilling to carry the water. They continued to use pit latrines and shallow wells, and they continued to get cholera. Until you had rules that were imposed by the Board of Health, which said to the tenement owners, you must provide clean water, you must provide sewers, or you pay a fine, right? Which is exactly what the Board of Health did. You didn't start having actually a safer city. And it reminds us that you need not just infrastructure, but institutions and incentives as well, if our cities are gonna become places of health. Now, when COVID-19 came to the US first, it looked a lot like uh, Athens in uh, 430 BC or Constantinople in 541. It came in through the nodes, came in particularly through New York, through John F. Kennedy Airport, by tourists returning from Europe. And you can see it spread in places that were close to the nodes originally. It was a highly urban pandemic initially. This is the case rates according and the relationship to population density across the US in, at the end of April, 2020. And you can see the denser areas had a much higher level of the disease. 
This is not what we saw six months later. So by the end of November, it looked more like a rural plague. And just like the influenza pandemic of 1918, 19, right? This airborne thing can basically spread everywhere. It's not something that actually, you know, living in a low density area will, will save you. Interestingly, the plague of Athens seems to have done no damage whatsoever to the lower density Spartans. And cholera was never much of a problem if you lived at low enough density levels to have your own well. Um, Brazil, this is in June, share the population living in an informal settlement called a favela, uh, strongly correlated with COVID rates uh, in June. This is the share of the population living in the slum in, in India. Again, urban density strongly associated with, uh, with these rates. Um, but in fact, the remarkable work of Anup Malani and his co-authors, which did serological testing in Mumbai slums in July, meaning they're doing blood work looking for COVID antibodies, showed that by July, more than 50% of the residents of Mumbai slums had already been exposed to COVID-19. Okay, so uh, this just spread like wildfire. The death rates were not that high, presumably because the residents of Mumbai slums are young, they're thin, and they're probably exposed to things which are reasonably similar to COVID-19 relatively recently. Now, it's not as if density is a guarantee of death. It's human contact, which is actually the thing which spreads the disease. And so this is a map of New York City, and this shows you, as of May 2020, the cases per capita. Now, for those of you who know your New York geography, uh, so this is Manhattan, and this is the most built up part of the entire metropolis, okay? It is also the area where you had by far the lowest COVID cases. This is Brooklyn Heights, the inner areas of Brooklyn. Again, the lowest areas, but very dense. Go further away, go to Staten Island. This is outer Queens, this is the Bronx. These areas have much higher rates of COVID. So it's not like within New York, density isn't all positively associated with getting the disease. Now, what's going on? Behavioral response, okay? Everything is always about the behavioral response, which is why mechanical uh, immunology, immunology models often get it wrong. This shows the change in the number of trips as measured by the safe graph cellular data by zip code in New York. And you can see those inner areas, those ultra high density areas were the ones that had the lowest trips. And because their trips decline the most, it looks like they had the lowest diseases. And this is the relationship between change in trips and cases per person. In our preferred specification, we estimate that a 20% change in, in trips is associated with a 10% reduction in the number of cases. Okay, so really a very substantial elasticity of trips with respect to mobility. We are, by the way, not at all claiming that it was the New York City public transit that was the place where the disease was spread. It may well have been where people went when they got off of their, their transit ships. Um, we are not also meaning to suggest that the people in the outer boroughs were somehow they're being foolish. The primary difference is they were poor, okay? So rich people, and this has been a terrible feature of this pandemic, rich people have had the luxury to shelter in place. They've had the luxury to telework. Poor people have not. And you can see here the relationship between the change in trips and the share of people who are working in essential industries. Poor New Yorkers were much more likely to be in essential industries. This is the change in the number of trips by the share of people who worked in occupations which were deemed by Dingle and Naiman to be teleworkable, to be occupations that could involve teleworking. So again, the high skilled, wealthier New Yorkers were the ones that were able to reduce their trips and they were the ones that were able to have a much lower case rate and a much lower death rate as a result. Now, this pandemic strikes cities at a point in time in which they feel far weaker than they did 20 years ago when 9-11 struck New York City and essentially all of America got together behind Rudy Giuliani. It's only almost unimaginable now uh, to think about Rudy Giuliani as being America's mayor as he was 20 years ago. And there was a common belief that cities required good, strong, functional government. There was a common belief that cities brought opportunity. Um, and much of that has broken down. I'm gonna talk about three forms of urban weakness that predated COVID. There is of course a fourth, which is race and policing which is a particularly terrible form of urban weakness. But uh, I think that would take me too far afield. Um, so I'm gonna talk about three elements in this. The first of which is that cities are making adults richer. They are making them more productive, but they are not treating their children well, at least not in America. This is joint work with Brandon Tan. It relies on the Opportunity Atlas data, which is assembled by uh, Raj Chetty, uh, John Friedman, and Nathan Hendren. The second point, which is a point that I've been making for 20 years, is successful cities are making themselves unaffordable by restricting their ability to build. 
I call this America's housing failure. The first one is America's education failure. The third is our cities are closing their frontier. Our cities, because of the limits of housing and because of other restrictions, are no longer providing an escape valve for the jobless parts of the country. And so we have this increasingly problem of mass joblessness, particularly in America's eastern heartland. And this is the third sense in which the country feels like it's falling apart. Um, and it brought you some of the political problems that we've seen over the past four years in the US. So first, the data on opportunity. Your left is the relationship between population density and GDP per capita. As I hope all of you know, the fact that cities, workers in cities earn more is not just a static effect, it's also a dynamic effect. When young workers come to cities, they experience faster wage growth. This was a fact that I first documented in Cities and Skills with Dave Murray, and there's a much better documentation of it that's done by De La Roca and Puga using administrative Spanish data in a review of economic studies five years ago. Okay, so tremendously good for adults. The other graph, though, on the right, shows the relationship between upward mobility from the Chetty Frieden, Frieden Hendrick data. Now, what is this data? This takes a, a generation that was born between 1978 and 1983. It plots them, you know, where their income, where they are in the income distribution as their parents are with their kids. They typically look at kids whose parents are at the 25th percentile, meaning three quarters of parents are, are richer than they are. And it looks at what income percentile they end up in as adults uh, 30 years later. Okay, so it gives you a sense in which poor kids are turning into richer adults. So those numbers like 0 0.44, 0 0.42, that means that if you're at these lowest population densities, you move from the 25th to the 44th. Uh, if you're in the high population densities, you end up below the 40th. So there's sort of a four percentile drop in where you end up as adults, which is really a massive change associated with being in cities. It shows the relationship, uh, uh, this is white and this is African-Americans. So as you can see, it's true for both white and African-Americans, although the upward mobility for whites is a lot higher than, than the upward mobility for African-Americans. And if you're an urban African-American, you end up only moving from the 25th to the 32nd percentile. This looks at the relationship between density within the metropolitan area. So those were facts across metropolitan areas. This is within metropolitan areas. And here, as you can see, you're going from, you know, the 44th percentile down to the 38th percentile as you get higher in density. This shows the relationship between track mobility and distance to the central business district. And as you can see here, as you move away from the center city, your upward mobility is going up. This shows your mobility at the border of a central city school district. So these are just kids who are inside versus outside of the central city school district. And here you can see you get a, uh, a two percentile jump up in your upward mobility right at the central city school district. And you have a, uh, called a one percentile drop in your probability of being incarcerated in jail as an adult right at the Central City School District. So there are, this shows these in regression effects and regressions that it, it's, uh, they're all sort of essentially the same thing, which is there's a sharp break at the school district. And this controls flexibly for a polynomial for distance from the, from the Central Business District. So there really is a trend break there. Now, there are at least three explanations for this. There surely are more, but there's sort of three causal explanations that I want to highlight. The first of which I already have, which is the failures of America's central city schools. Okay, so our large schools have been failing for many decades, despite a very robust education reform movement. We have been unable to fix fix this. This is not a natural thing about cities. Very few Britons think they need to leave London uh, to get a better education for their kids. Even fewer Parisians think they need to leave uh, Paris to get uh, get a better education for the kids. And yet in America, millions and millions of parents feel that they need to move out. Um, and those schools and the exodus of wealthier parents from schools helps explain why the data for adults and the data for kids look so different. That upward mobility for adults and kids assuredly reflects partially the fact that adults in cities experience a largely integrated world. They may live in a segregated block, but when they go into work, they typically are in the urban service sectors, which means they interact with people from all walks of life. They're not living a life on their own. Whereas if you're a 10 year old who lives in a housing project, you go from a poor neighborhood to a poor school and then back again. You basically are never mixing with a wide range of human capital. You're living in a village of poverty as isolated as any rural town in the Metsu Journal. Um, second hypothesis, um, cities allow for even more segregation uh, when they're larger. The bigger the city, the larger the segregation level. Okay, that's a general fact, and it's easy to understand why. When we're in a relatively small area, it's, it's hard to find exactly a neighborhood with people that are like you. 
in cities, you have lots of ability to find exactly the right match. Now, that means that poor people tend to match much more with poor people and African-Americans tend to match more with African-Americans. And uh, so it has been for a very long time. And you can see here the relationship between African-American white dissimilarity, the measure of segregation, and lower levels of, of African-American mobility. And um, about half of the overall city size effect disappears once you control for segregation uh, for African-Americans. The third hypothesis, which is one that a previous urban studies lecturer has emphasized, is the possibility that uh, this low level of upward mobility is actually driven by pollutants themselves. So lead in the paint, uh, smoke in the air, various bad things that come with cities. Again, it's a live hypothesis, especially for this generation born between 78 to 82. But it certainly you know, gives the lie to this view that cities may be unequal, but they are at least turning poor people into rich people. I mean, I have always taken the view that cities should never apologize for their inequality. Cities have rich people and poor people because they're pleasant places to be rich and relatively tolerable places to take to be poor. You know, Plato wrote about that every, in, every, in any city of whatever size is reality two cities, one a city of the rich and the other a city of the poor and they are perpetually at war with each other. But that inequality is acceptable if cities are providing an up escalator for the poor to become rich. And yet it seems so strongly that they are not right now. And that's an urban problem which eliminates the sense of a common destiny and creates part of the weakness that cities face when they come to terms with a pandemic. I'll just skip over this. This is again a frustration. Second urban problem, high prices in cities. So in some sense, the rise of urban prices reflects a urban triumph, reflects demand for urban amenities, reflects demand for urban jobs. Um, this just shows the price growth by Federal Housing Finance Agency repeat sales index, uh, by quintile of population density across America's metropolitan areas. As you can see, almost all of the price growth is in the densest quintile uh, of American cities. This uses Zillow data at the subsidy level using uh, distance to the central business district. There's been a tilt where price growth was much higher, close to the city center than away, again, reflecting this demand for uh, big city amenities. But of course, it's not just demand, it's supply. Um, and this is a kind of graph that just has no demand side explanation. So along the horizontal axis is the amount of new permitting, the amount of new building. So this is the number of permits issued between 2000 and 2013 divided by the 2000 housing stock. So some places like Austin literally added 50% uh, more housing relative to what they had in 2000. Um, along, the horizontal, along the vertical axis is the ratio between housing and houses, the current housing price and the marginal physical cost of consumption, uh, marginal, phys marginal physical cost of construction. So it's the gap between how much it costs to buy a house and how much it costs to build a house divided by uh, the marginal physical cost of construction. So this tells you at what premium housing is selling relative to the cost of actually building the housing. And as you can see from this, right, the places that are expensive don't build a lot, and the places that build a lot aren't expensive. This does not admit a demand side explanation, right? There is demand for Austin and there is demand for San Francisco. The only way you can understand why it's, they're different is because Austin ha makes it very easy to build and consequently prices stay reasonable, and San Francisco makes it very difficult to build. Now, it is absolutely true, as Albert Saez has shown us, that part of the thing uh, that's going on in San Francisco is the physical geography. But of course, there's more than just physical geography. There's plenty of land in Los Angeles. There's plenty of land in San Diego. And yet these places are unbelievably expensive and they build a tiny fraction of what they once did. That's the impact of local land use controls that protect insiders, that protect current homeowners from change, that protect them from losing their view, but impose enormous costs on outsiders who would come to the city. Again, causing there to be a, a lack of a sense of common destiny. Third urban trauma. Um, the rise of not working and its geographic concentration. So when I was born in 1967, roughly 5% of prime age males were jobless. Prime age is defined by the US Census as 25 to 54, which is a definition with which I increasingly find uh, offensive. But uh, the, uh, you know, 50 years later, for most of the past decade, the share not working among men have been, has been over 15%. It's tripled. So a tripling in the share of prime age men who are not associated with the labor force. This does not show up in the unemployment statistics because it's not as if these people are actually actively looking for work. They have left the labor force entirely. And as you can see, it is a spatially concentrated phenomenon. Um, it is particularly true in America's Eastern heartland in a uh, zone that starts in Louisiana and Mississippi down here, rises up through Appalachia and ends up in the cities of the Rust Belt, okay? These are areas where human capital is relatively low. They're suffering from a post-industrial hangover. 
and it is the epicenter of America's social distress. There also are, particularly in Native American areas, issues over here, and there is a zone associated with Northern California and Southern Oregon, which is also quite high. These are not the, coast, the cities that you know, these are actually more rural areas on the West Coast. This is what the same map looked like in 1980. Um, it is still true, it was still true in 1980 that the, you know, the area which had the highest levels of joblessness was the Eastern heartland, but they were much lower. They were 15% instead of 30%, or 15% instead of 25%. So really a very large gap. And it's not the same thing for women. And the whole phenomenon is in fact quite different for women. So women divide on a north-south basis. Their numbers are quite different. And women who are not in the labor force just look entirely different from men who are not in the labor force. They typically are not miserable. Uh, they are not associated with the suicide. They're not associated with uh, family breakups. And they're typically doing things like caring for their loved ones, right? They're caring for their parents, they're caring for kids. Uh, I will show you a graph in a second of what men who are not working uh, are doing. Um, this is the map of opioid consumption in the US in 2015. You can see also it's concentrated in America's Eastern heartland as well, as well as some of the areas of the West. Um, and this just shows you the impact of, of the manufacturing share predicts at least some part of the rise of joblessness. Now, um, joblessness is associated with misery. Here I've split up the country into the coast, the Eastern heartland, the Western heartland. I've showed you life satisfaction for those people who are employed, for those men who are employed earning more than $50,000 a year, employed earning between 35 and 50, and employed learning less than 35 and not working. And as you can see, the gradient is really relatively weak with income. And this is a, a long known fact that the level of income is not as strongly associated with happiness. It's there, but it's not massive, right? But when you go to not working, all of a sudden it just soars. And I think that reminds you that a sense of satisfaction is not primarily determined by the, your paycheck. It's primarily determined by the social connections that people have through their jobs often, and the sense of purpose that they actually get through their work, even if their jobs are, are not all that exciting. Um, I said I would show you what they're doing. Um, so this shows you, again, by these three different regions, pay attention perhaps to the Eastern heartland, which is the most representative. So what are the not working people doing with the six hours on average a day, they're not working. So here they are 30, 30 and 82 to 28, right? about a six hour difference. Well, they're spending 15 minutes looking for work. That's not all that much. Uh, they're spending 17 minutes more getting educated. How about caring for others? Wow, that's amazing. They're spending an additional nine minutes a day caring for others, which kind of tells you that every time you see a New York Times story about this house husband who's left the workforce to care for his kids, remember that's one person, right? And that's a very uncommon phenomenon. Instead, what are they actually doing? Well, they're watching five hours of television, okay? Although there is some sense in which computer gaming may be tending to cut into that. So it's primarily about having your face on a screen. And that's what this joblessness is all about. Um, where are they living? How are they surviving? Many of them are actually living with their parents. And this just shows you that among taking the entire 25 to 54 year old population, so these are not kids, about 30% of the long-term not working are actually living with their parents um, in, this, in this population. Now, um, this rise in joblessness uh, inv should involve something of a change in how we think about America's economic geography. So America has always been a place with extraordinarily regional heterogeneity in incomes. And in many ways, those gaps have shrunk over time. In 1950, Mississippi was the poorest state in the union, and there were 17 other states that had per capita incomes that were double that in Mississippi. 60 years later, Mississippi is still the poorest state in the union, but there's not a single state with an income that is double that of Mississippi. No state doubles it, okay? But joblessness is a new twist. And if it involves market failures, meaning externalities of different forms, then this should lead us to look at regional policies again. The classic Pigouvian externality about, about joblessness is, of course, just that people who don't work don't pay taxes and receive social insurance. And I, at least for me, this has led me to rethink place-based policies. Uh, I still am deeply worried and really not very comfortable with the idea of taking from rich regions and giving to poor regions. But I am very comfortable with the idea that policy should target the actual needs of those areas and should be targeted to areas uh, where they can do the most good. Moreover, there are good reasons to think that America is becoming less fluid geographically and more European in, in its stasis. So, throughout most of American history, we have been a country where people have moved from 
poorer areas to richer areas. 200 years ago, Americans left the rocky soil of New England to find some form of prosperity in, in the richer area of the Ohio River Valley. In the late 19th century, they left farms to move to cities like Chicago and Detroit. In the years of the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Okies fled the Dust Bowl to find some kind of uh, promise in, in, the Western, in the West Coast. Now, for the first time in that history, that's become increasingly difficult. For many reasons, one reason above all is the failure to build affordable housing in cities like San Francisco and New York. Um, and you can see here the drop in migration rates. So in, from 1950 to 1992, you never had fewer than 6% of Americans who moved across county lines every year. For the past 10 years, you have never had more than 4% of Americans move across county lines. So there's a one third drop according to the current population survey in terms of inter-county migration. What migration does occur is highly skewed towards the skilled. So this shows the college graduation rate for people who leave areas relative to the college graduation rate for people who don't leave. Almost everywhere, the leavers are more educated than the non-leavers. And in places where the, that are start with a very low level of education, the gaps are larger still. So these places that are down here. So this really tells you that if you were hoping that out migration of people from Appalachia, from Mississippi was gonna somehow they make things better, that would have been true in a subsistence agricultural economy where having fewer farmers to farm the land increases uh, the wages for those that remain. But in a world in which human capital is destiny for the person, for the region and for the country, right? The denuding of high skilled workers from these areas leaves them even more vulnerable. Um, added changes, the work of Peter Ganong and Danny Shoig has shown us that there's no longer been migration of the less skilled towards high wage areas, it's no longer directed. Uh, again, uh, just emphasizing that at least some part of this is surely to do with housing. There's a strong tendency of places that start with a higher uh, level of college education to see that level of college education uh, increase more rapidly. Enrico Moretti showed that in 2004. I showed that with uh, Barry in my 2006 paper. And income convergence across metropolitan areas has largely disappeared. So this was a pervasive phenomenon through the 1980s, uh, documented particularly by uh, Robert Barrow and Javi Sally Martin, regional convergence essentially stopped at the time period in which they documented it, right? And it's basically disappeared in some part because of the tendency of skilled people to move into skilled areas. And of course, far from having any kind of um, mean reversion of not working rates, this shows the not working rate at the Puma level on, in 1980 on the not working rate in 2010. And not only is this correlation over 80%, but the coefficient is more than one, okay? so. The places that you know started with higher levels of not working have just stayed there. There's no sense in which these people are undoing each other. Now, I do think this is a reason to rethink place-based policies. Um, again, there have always been three plausible stories for place-based policies, one of which is the existence of agglomeration and human capital externalities, sometimes called the sort of giving a region a big push, uh, like the Tennessee Valley Authority. But we really can't measure the shape of externalities well enough to know if we want to move the skill in, into West Virginia or into Silicon Valley, right? We know that there's an externality from the skill in either place, but we don't know necessarily where we want to shift people. The second case for place-based policies was insurance and redistribution. But if you do place-based redistribution, you're, you know, you're going to distort the migration decision. You're going to push up housing prices in places where housing is inelastic. And uh, only 6% of variation in income is accounted for at the, in the US at the county level, right? So there's really very little of Americans' income variability, which is explained by place. And so place-based redistribution really doesn't do a lot for reducing overall income uh, inequality in the US. The third case is that different local conditions call for different policies. This is place-based targeting, not place-based redistribution. So a simple example of this is in some places in the US, housing supply is very limited. It's inelastic and it's fixed, like San Francisco, like uh, New York City, like Boston. In those areas, it makes at least plausible sense to subsidize housing construction. It makes no sense to subsidize housing construction in places like Houston, Texas, where you know, builders are essentially unfettered and do a remarkable job of providing affordable housing for ordinary Americans. And it also makes no sense to subsidize housing in places like Detroit, which has an enormous amount of inexpensive housing and enormous amount of vacancies. In places where housing demand is, is where housing supply is elastic, it makes more sense to subsidize housing vouchers, to subsidize demand. The same logic applies for employment subsidies, right? So if I have an employment subsidy and I have a lot of people who are on the margin to working or not working, like in West Virginia, then subsidizing work will do more to bring people into working. 
if I subsidize employment in Seattle, where almost everybody is working, you'll have many fewer people on the margin between working and not working. And so you'll get very few people in with the same level of subsidy. And so the case, if you've got a limited amount of job subsidies to go around, throw them where the jobless are, not where the jobless aren't. And we did some estimates of this in different parts of the country and came up with some suggested ideas. This is from a paper that's joint with Larry Summers and Ben Austin. Now, the pandemic, back to the pandemic. So the pandemic was not just uh, a health catastrophe, it was an economic catastrophe. And it's an economic catastrophe that may end up having even longer term consequences for cities. In part, it was such an economic catastrophe because of the evolution of work in our world. I have already alluded to the fact that uh, during an age of agriculture, the plague was a health disaster, but it was not an economic disaster because wages rose substantially as the number of people diminished relative to the amount of land. And so there was an economic boom that followed the Black Death. The 1919-1918 influenza pandemic was a short, sharp shock. Factories were shut down, mine workers called in sick. Uh, there was a mini recession that occurred then. Francois Bell shows it, but boy, it was fast. Uh, it was over really quickly, partially because the goods that the industrial economy created and does create are not themselves uh, harmed by the pandemic. You weren't afraid of buying a car or an iron because you might get the disease from them. You still aren't. By contrast, over the past hundred years, we've evolved from factories to urban service jobs. And those jobs, right, which provided a haven for less educated workers, where the ability to serve a latte with a smile meant that there was someone who was rich enough to be willing to pay five bucks for that latte, right? Those workers, those jobs can disappear in a heartbeat when that smile becomes a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. And that of course is exactly what we've seen. This just shows the evolution of work over the past 20 years. The light blue line that starts at the top in March 2000 is manufacturing jobs. Now, of course, it's the lowest. And of course, manufacturing had been declining in absolute terms since 1979 and as a share of the US economy since 1950. Um, the middle two lines, the yellow one and the blue one, blue one, are the urban service economy. The 32 million workers in 2019 who were in retail trade, leisure and hospitality, these were the sectors that were most vulnerable to the pandemic, right? You could either go and risk getting the disease or uh, stay, stay at home and lose your job. And many of them did uh, lose their jobs. Um, the top two lines are a little bit safe. So the green line is education and health services. These are teachers. These are uh, nurses, these are paramedics. So they by and large got to keep their jobs, although there was a big drop in medical employment at the start of the pandemic. Um, but for many of them, they're backstopped by uh, federally funded programs or local government. So their jobs continued, um, even though they were the most risk for getting the disease. The orange line shows professional and business services. They're the lucky ones probably like all of all, everyone on this call falls in this category. Uh, and they managed to zoom their way. So it was painful, it was hard, but most of us were able to keep our jobs, even though we had to lecture by Zoom. Um, shows the extent of small business carnage. This is from a series of surveys that myself and a, a, several co-authors, including Alex Bartik, Zoe Cullen, Chris Stanton, Marion Bertrand, and Mike Luca were involved in. This was the picture of the American small business economy in April 2020. This is from a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so 45% uh, of small businesses in our sample, this is the alignable network, uh, were closed. Um, among retailers, 53%, among arts and entertainment, 70%, among personal services, so those would be like masseuses and personal trainers, 86% of them were closed. By contrast, only 19% of banking and finance were closed. And we were particularly terrified when this data came out because 37% of these firms said that they would be closed in December. This was before the avalanche of cash that was handed out to small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program, which has now dispersed about $1 trillion uh, to small businesses throughout America. Gosh, I remember when a trillion used to actually uh, be real money. Um, now, not only was there the you know, disease-related economic slowdown, but there is this fear going forward that the change to remote work will become permanent. That this vision that Alvin Toffler had in the third wave 40 years ago, that we would all go to electronic cottages and dial it in, that that would become the new normal. This just shows the safe graph data of people not coming into work anymore. So you can see 70% declines in Italy, 50% uh, declines in most other places. Um, will this become permanent? Now, for 40 years, Toffler was wrong, right? Um, I, I you know, 
wrote some of my earliest papers saying why I thought he was wrong. But it's clear where his logic came from. Is in some sense, he used the same logic that Paul Krugman made much of in the New Economic Geography, which is thinking about technologies that are centrifugal, that push you away from cities, and technologies that are centripetal, that draw you in. The 19th century very much was a centripetal age where technologies like the steam engine, elevated railway, the elevator, uh, the skyscraper, all of these technologies favored cities. They had large fixed costs, many of them. They embedded sort of these nodes at the center of these, these networks, right? They were hub and spoke transportation technologies and they made cities grow up, they made cities grow out. So it was a very centripetal age. By contrast, much of the 20th century felt centrifugal. The, ca the car, of course, was a child of the city, produced first in German cities and then mass produced in Detroit, but it enabled enormous dispersal of population. The work of Nate Baum Snow finds that every new highway that cut through an urban core after World War II reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as a whole. And of course, that's before you can get to radios and televisions, which enabled people living in far-flung farms to experience the pleasures that had previously been reserved for the denizens of Broadway. Um, these centrifugal technologies killed urban industries like the New York City garment sector, which was the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s, larger than automobiles in Detroit, right? It was pinned down by the port. It had lots of low cost labor uh, and globalization just slaughtered it. You know, five years, hundreds of thousands of jobs gone, you know, never to recover. And this was the background for what Toffer was writing. So it occurred to me that if container ships and uh, cheap trains and highways had killed off urban industry, then why wouldn't these, the hot new information technology devices of the 1980s, why wouldn't they kill off the urban, the urban information industries? Why would people continue to come to offices to do uh, things together? Yet for 40 years, he was wrong. And it looked as if instead of killing face-to-face -face contact, that in fact, these new technologies were complementing face-to-face contact and the cities that make that contact easier. So these are two images of face-to-face -face workplaces. This is Michael Bloomberg's City Hall, a Wallace office, which was based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which was based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor, right? Here you have uh, uh, you know, enormously smart people who really value being right next to each other because that's how you learn exactly what's going on. And when you think about it, you know, trading floors are an institution in which you have other and they're there for one simple reason because knowledge is more important than space because the returns to knowledge became so much higher in an era of globalization in an era of new technologies right and that is exactly what's happened over the last 40 years and that's exactly what stopped Toffler's vision from becoming a reality is that in a more connected world we valued face-to-face -face contact more look I mean if technology were making face-to-face -face contact irrelevant before 2020 why is it that Google Right, which of all the companies in all the world should have managed long distance work, why did they buy the Googleplex? Why did they buy a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan uh, to make sure that their workers were right on top of each other? Because they believe that's how creativity works. And the more complicated the world becomes, the easier it is for those complex ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's figuring out whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your students. And that is part of the great challenge uh, of lecturing over Zoom is that we actually don't get those same feedbacks and it becomes harder, the more complicated the subject. So with that background, what happened in 2020? Well, first of all, we discovered that a lot of things actually could be done over Zoom. A lot of things could be done remotely. We had hints of this in the work of Nick Bloom of Stanford before the COVID struck where he looked at a randomized controlled trial involving call center workers in China and found that the call center workers who were sent home were actually more productive, not less productive. My students, Natalia and Emmanuel and, and uh, Emma Harrington, both who are, are uh, graduating, are um, leaving our PhD program, looked at call center workers at a major online retailer in uh, the US. And they find, like Bloom does, a substantial increase in productivity as measured by calls per hour of their workers. So at least initially, the number of calls per hour went way up rather than down, free from the distractions. <laughs> of being around people. There is other evidence to support this as well. But, so that's being shown on the left-hand side, but look at the right-hand side. 
So the right-hand side shows first promotion to mid-level, basically everyone gets that, but then showing you the promotion rates to upper-level management. It's not really upper-level management. These are call center workers. So what, what promotion means is you go from handling simple calls to handling complicated calls, calls with more difficult people. And you can see there's a huge difference between the on-site workers and the remote workers. Now, why would that be? I think once again, face-to-face -face contact is showing us ability to permit learning. I'm not sure whether or not that learning is the workers who are learning how to handle complicated calls by listening to people around them or the managers who are observing their workers doing the calls and actually learning which ones are good and which ones are not. But either way, it looks like once again, urban density, the density of being on site is associated with a, with a faster growth path. Um, Nick Bloom found a similar fact in his Chinese data as well, higher promotion rates on site. Similar fact about learning. This is work from uh, Jose Ramon Moraz Aria and Carlos Taboin. Um, this shows postings, which are uh, agglomerated, which are put together by burning glass and uh, employment. They have split occupations into occupations that cannot be done remotely and occupations that can be done remotely, again, using the Dingle and Neyman classification. Um, what you can see over there on your left is the number of postings and employment for non-remotable jobs. You can see employment really drops in May, and then it comes back, postings really drop, then they come back. By contrast, look at the remotable jobs. Employment doesn't have the same dip. Employment persists, right? People are still Zooming. But look at what happens to new hires. They drop and they don't come back up. So for example, Microsoft has released research saying that its programmers are just as productive as home as they always have been. But the burning glass data shows that new hires for programmers are down by 40%. This suggests that these firms are coasting on old relationships. They have hired people who they knew were committed to the firm and who had some connection to the firm during the pre-period. And they're not willing to take on new people, even because they don't trust themselves to be able to find workers who are committed enough, excited enough. And indeed, the Harrington and Emanuel work finds that workers who join for purely remote jobs are less capable, um, or because they think they cannot create part of a corporate culture with them. And again, it hints at this dynamic nature of face-to-face -face contact. Another limitation of the Zoom lifestyle is that the life of, of Zoom work is even more unequal than the work that preceded it. So in May of 2020, 50 million Americans had lost their jobs because of the pandemic and 50 million Americans were uh, teleworking. The Americans who lost their job were disproportionately uh, lower educated, but the gradient is relatively narrow. So 14% of people with advanced degrees lost their job because of COVID and 20% of people with high school diplomas had lost the job because of COVID. But turn instead to the teleworking shares. In May, what share of people with advanced degrees were teleworking? 68.9%, essentially 70% of them were, were, were telecommuting. What share of high school dropouts? 5%, okay? 15% of people with a high school diploma. This Zoom life is one that has left the less educated part of America completely behind. It is in no sense a solution for anything for less skilled parts of the economy. If we're going to come back with an economy that is remotely inclusive, it is one that has to come back to live jobs. Finally, again, using our survey of small businesses with Alignable, which we supplemented with a survey of uh, economists, the National Association of Business Economists, we asked uh, these respondents, what share of their workers would switch to remote did they think would stay remote? We got answers that basically mean that if you add these three categories together, 41% of firms said that 40% or more of their workers would switch to remote would stay remote. Um, the other sample has 36%. So that's a pretty big number. Okay, so if you think that that's 20% of the people have switched, given that 50 million switched at this time period, that means 10 million workers switching to remote, which is a pretty big shock. Now, of course, it's not the lifeblood that Toffler imagined that these things would be to cities, because what Toffler forgot about is that even though remote working increased, the overall increase in the labor force was so large that it swamped any of that. And so there were no empty skyscrapers as Toffler envisioned. So looking forward, even if you do have a significant increase in, in uh, online work, the question is how quickly will the overall increase in the labor force uh, undo that? Now, looking forward to the future of cities, and I'll just give you a few slides of my, uh, of my quite dubious crystal ball. So I see before us two different paths. One is very bleak, one is still difficult. The bleak path is that the pandemic becomes essentially permanent. So let's say we get sufficiently many mutations to this virus that elude the vaccines that have been in play, or let's say we get another pandemic within the next five years. 
then we're going to see quite significant changes in both urban location and the demand for transportation. This will shatter the urban service in industry, create enormous economic pain, which at least suggests that the governments of the rich world should be willing to spend an enormous amount to make sure that this doesn't happen. And that spending must not just be in their own countries, right? They must also recognize that a disease that starts anywhere can go everywhere, which is exactly what's happened here. And so the sewers of Hyderabad are a health issue in San Jose, California. And so investing in the health of the developing world is something that's crucial to make sure that this does not happen again. Now, even if this does end quickly, right? Even if it doesn't happen again, then the shock to urban life you know, uh, is still significant. Um, so there is gonna be a significant drop in demand for urban commercial space. That means that prices are gonna drop more than vacancies will rise in rich cities, but you may have significant vacancies which become more problematic in poorer cities. And I'll show you a little bit on office rents in a second. I believe that commercial space will be more vulnerable than residential space. One thing that we have seen over and over again is when the restrictions are lifted, young people have rushed back out again to connect with other young people. And that is ultimately the strength of the city. Even more so than city's ability to make us smart by being around other smart people is the fact that cities offer us the joy, the pleasures of being around other human beings and celebrating with them and connecting with them. Um, and so I think class C commercial space may well be reallocated to residential. Um, cities will probably reallocate from the old to the young. The young crave the connection more. The young do not have their own private offices. Um, and some significant work will move to homes or lower density locales. So it's not that I believe that city life is vulnerable, but I believe that every city has some form of risk because the rich and businesses have never been more mobile. And so if you try to solve every social problem by taxing the rich and taxing, taxing businesses at the city level, the national level doesn't matter. The national level, the national level, you can't escape the taxes. So that's the right level at which to tax people if you're going to do it. But if you're going to try and engage in local redistribution, you face enormous risks. And this is exactly sort of the fear that I have in New York. So I've lived through this before. We lived, I lived through a world in which New York City and other major American cities try to solve every social wrong by taxing their richer citizen, taxing businesses. The rich and the business is just left. And it left a city that, you know, not just President Ford, but it seemed like history itself was, was tossing into the trash heap. A world in which we think our cities are going to be local welfare states is a world that feels like it is completely ignoring the fact that Zoom has made, if anything, the rich more mobile. Um, now, this is a little bit of data on commercial rents. And you can see the gap between these are high-end cities and these are low-end cities. So look, I mean, New York is currently at $82 a square foot. San Francisco, 86, Silicon Valley, 60. Even if these places had commercial rents that dropped by 50%, those units would still be occupied. Okay, it doesn't make any sense to leave a space empty if it can rent for 40 bucks a square foot. And there will be someone who's willing to pay for 40 bucks a square foot to occupy a space that previously had rented at 80. Um, this is of course true also for London. Uh, this is true for Paris. This is true for the most expensive cities in the world, which prior to 2020, the big problem was it wasn't enough office space. And so you may have some banks move out, but scrappier, smaller entrepreneurs will come in. There'll be younger businesses in, 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 change, in exchange for older businesses. And that's not bad, right? Jane Jacobs correctly thought that, you know, cities need cheap space to be incubators for, for new businesses. She just was wrong that historic preservation was a good way to get cheap space. Now, what about these cities? Well, these are the places I would worry about. So these are places where price per square foot is 20 bucks or 19 bucks. You know, when your rents go below 15 bucks, it's hard to even understand why you're keeping the space open. So if you have a 20% drop in commercial rents in Detroit or Cleveland, these places may well shape, face major vacancies. And the problem is that once you start getting vacancies, those vacancies have large ripples throughout the entire economy because you stop having demand for the local businesses that cater to the workers who come in. Whereas it doesn't matter that much in terms of if the workers are younger versus older. You may have the restaurants may get a little bit cheaper, they may get a little scruffier, but that's not all bad. That was just like the 70s. Um, what we think is going to happen in terms of future demand for cities, you know, somewhat remarkably, 2020 was a period of price run-ups, not price declines, as everyone sort of hunkered for space. Um, so the first force, when we think about, you know, let's say urban housing prices, uh, is that economic dis dislocation is going to have to lower some prices at some point in time, especially if the enormous amount of deficit spending, which the new administration seems to be uh, committed to, ends up pushing up interest rates, which is, has historically been the pattern. So higher interest rates and economic dislocation is likely to push prices down. You're gonna have a relocation from office to home, uh, which should increase demand for residential. Okay, so 
people who work from home typically have larger spaces at home and there's gonna be more demand for that. You may also have a demand for larger offices, which comes from sanitary concerns. Um, Third, you're gonna have a fear of shared spaces, at least some going forward, forward which again, should be a pro-suburbanizing force. It should be a, uh, a centrifugal force. Fourth, the dropping global travel should lead to a reallocation of supply from Airbnb to purely residential and lower prices overall. So these are all headwinds. But I think ultimately, these are amazingly resilient. I don't think this is gonna be as bad as the 1970s. I don't think it's even gonna be close. And I don't think it's gonna take us anywhere back to, uh, to, to Justinian's fleet. But it is certainly true that our cities are in more danger than they have been for many decades. And it's certainly true that we need to care for them. And that you know, trying to fix the cities, both of the wealthy and the poor world, continues to be one of the great vocations of the 21st century. I believe that cities will come back and they will come back strong, strong, but we continue to need to invest not just in the critical public health investments, but also in the investments that can make cities once again places of opportunity, once again places of affordability, and once again places of economic transformation. So as well as of course cultural and political change as well. So with that, I will end my uh, I will end the formal part of the lecture and take your questions. Ed, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, if any, if, uh, if people have uh, questions, if you could let me know via the chat box, that would be uh, most appreciated. Um, Ed, I have the privilege of perhaps asking the first question, if I might. One of the things that I always find about a good paper or a good lecture is that there are multiple points that you can jump off from. Um, I'm attracted to your discussion of the failures, um, education failure, housing failure, employment failure, and, uh, and positioning those in relation to the pandemic and wondering, you know, was it really a case that the pandemic is threatening a, a changing direction or rather the pandemic is shedding a light on our direction of travel if we're not to do anything. So I think, I think that is a very astute comment, John. I think that's exactly right. I think in some sense, all of these things re represent a failure of public management. The pandemic is itself a failure of public management. I mean, there were countries that got it a lot better. I mean, you didn't, you didn't see anything like this experience in Taiwan or Korea and New Zealand, of course, was magnificent, right? Uh, well-run countries that actually did what you need to do. They locked down quickly. They tested the asymptomatic, which was a hugely important thing, was to reopen only when you had, had actually been sure that the disease was gone. Um, and they just didn't have the same experience. But And that failure of management is exactly what we see in America's public schools, right? Which are a very difficult problem, but they're still a fundamental service of government that we have let, uh, let, let you know, go for far too long. Um, the policing failures are also a failure of management. Uh, because in fact, we have, you know, if you think about the arc of American policing, so our cities were lawless places in the 1980s and 1990s. We reacted by spending more on police, by increasing the number of, of cops, and by engaging in dr incredibly draconian prison lengths in the US, right? Just locking people away for an incredibly long time. And the somewhat remarkable thing is, in terms of creating urban safety, it worked. OK, but it was a very lopsided victory. It was a victory that came at a terrible human price by ruining the lives of millions and millions of Americans who got caught up in long prison sentences, as well as the millions who had to face things like stop and frisk at a regular basis. The humiliation of being you know, patted down by a cop for do having done absolutely nothing wrong. Now, uh, this is in some sense a failure of management. That's not what good policing looks like, um, but it's also a failure of priorities. You know, Manker Olson wrote this book, gosh, 40 years ago. Was very motivated by by England in the 1970s, uh, called the the rise and fall of nations, the rise and decline of nations, um, and he very much had it had a model in mind in which over time in peaceful societies, insiders acquire more and more power to actually stop change and protect themselves. He had in mind both people at the high end of, of the UK spectrum and people at the, and the labor unions. Both both sets of groups were in his in his eyes. He also used. Uh, pre-Tokugawa Japan as being another example of it. Uh, and he thought that in fact, one of the reasons why Germany and Japan had been so successful post-1945 is the war had destroyed those older insider groups. I thought when I read that book in graduate school 30 years ago, that it was largely a, you know, uh, didn't apply to the US. 
because it seemed like our country was dynamic enough and changing enough that we didn't have insider capture. And yet over the past 40 years, it feels like in place by place, we have privileged insiders and made outsiders pay. Whether or not those insiders are the wealthy urbanites who want protection from the poor, where, and we just didn't give a darn about the, the, poor, the poor kids who were being uh, harassed on the street or locked up. In the case of uh, the schools, the privileged insiders are the teachers. Uh, and the wealthy parents in suburbs, the outsiders are the poor kids in the inner city. Again, we care about those two groups of insiders, not the outsiders. Housing supply is all about protecting the insiders, the incumbent homeowners from any pain and you know, forgetting about the, the family who wants to move in and can't move in because it's too expensive. So I see very much in America where there's both a failure uh, to have effective public management, which is true of COVID, it's true of policing, it's true of, of um, the uh, education system, uh, but also a system which has done far too much to protect insiders at the expense of outsiders. Thanks very much. Very, very good. Um, Keith asks, uh, Keith Waters asks, if the more educated are more likely to migrate and rural folks are unemployed, should rich places subsidize rural education and likely benefit from rural to urban migration of the most able? You bet. Uh, I mean, I think I think, in fact, we need a national uh, I'm not going to call it a Marshall Plan. I think it's I think it's better described as an Apollo program for education. Um, the, so I, I believe, in fact, America's educational system, whether it's rural or urban, is vastly underperforming, apart from sort of well educated American suburbs. Um, we tried very hard during the Obama administration to have a, a thing called race to the top, which was sort of an attempt to use a small amount of money to leverage school change. It was a very clever idea. It didn't achieve very much. And I think thinking that we can get this on the cheap is somewhat foolish. I think it's actually gonna be an expensive thing, but it's also not a thing that actually just works by throwing money at school districts. Um, the overall, the work that Rick Hanushek has done over the past 35 years typically shows that the elasticity, the impact of just giving money to a school district on outcomes is very, very moderate. Um, and so you really need to sort of have a different change in management or a different, different style. It's also true that the entrenched power of the teachers unions make any form of reform very di difficult. It is possible that you could have a deal of reform for more cash, right? Which, was, which is actually effective, but you need to sort of think of the two things together. Another model is just to do an end run around traditional education entirely. And I, I particularly thought about this as being relevant for the urban service uh, economy and, and the urban poor. You could have vocational training that wraps around apprenticeship system, which works there. In the US, I think the attempts at doing vocational training for the, that tracks the young from an early age are you know, mixed at best. A different model, perhaps a more American model, is you essentially outsource vocational training. Uh, you make it competitive. You don't let it compete with the existing schools at all. So everyone still goes to a normal school, but on weekends, on the summer, after school, they have programs where they learn how to become carpenters and plumbers and, and computer programmers. And the beauty about outsourcing is because it's vocational, rather than traditional education, you can pay for performance, right? You can actually say to, to this agency, look, we're gonna see it at the end of the day, is it, does this person earn his license as a plumber? And if you haven't trained a plumber, you're not gonna get a penny. Okay, so you can actually do that, which you can't do for traditional training. The other th point I think I'd like to make though about, about the cash for reform is in the space of policing, okay? So, you know, we actually have a police force. We have police forces that managed to reduce crime significantly in this country over the last 30 years. But we need them to do two things. We need them both to reduce crime and to treat every one of our citizens with respect. Okay, we can't just have one without the other. Now, you can do that if we start measuring that second outcome, if we start measuring how much respect they're delivering, which requires, let's say, surveys of ordinary citizens done by independent groups and making the police chiefs accountable for their performance on these surveys. But if you're going to ask the cops to do more, you're gonna to have to pay them more. You can't defund the police and expect the police to actually provide both humanity and safety, right? You actually need to pay more to get more. And I think the sort of defund the police movement, while it is perfectly reasonable to experiment with having non-police providers of some services, right? That, but the, the general view that we're gonna use the police as a piggy bank to fund other services is I think completely wrong that in fact, you, you want to view safety as being a very important thing. And to remember that while it is, it should be a civil right for a young African-American child not to be you know, searched by the police for just walking around, um, it is also a civil right for a young African-American girl to be able to walk home from school without looking over her shoulder in fear. And we need police to do both of those things. And it's gonna require more money if we're gonna have that expectation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, has anyone else got a question for Ed, please? I've been giving very long-winded answers since I don't think there's uh, it's where people are jumping up at the at the queue here. Uh, uh, the uh, no, so, it seems like there's something else in the chat room. So just keep. Oh, yes, you fan or something. This is from Yingling. Uh, to some extent, the rising inequalities in the pandemic is a continuation of the pre-COVID trend. Pandemic certainly catalyzed and accelerated the trends, but the desire to segregate and seeking private space it had always been there, especially in the United States. You had mentioned about how the fear towards share space, how can cities address that fear, especially pre-COVID efforts have failed and now we're in a worse situation? So uh, you're exactly right. Again, just as John's uh, wise question started us off emphasized, it's, it's, uh, it, it's exacerbated pre-existing trends. The most important thing that needs to be done can't be done by cities. The most important things that need to be done are making sure that this pandemic goes away and we never again view the smile of another human being with fear. Without that, cities don't come back, right? Without that, we don't have any, any possibility of shared spaces. Cities can do a little bit of stockpiling of protective equipment, but beyond that, there's not a lot that cities themselves can do to make sure there isn't another pandemic. The things that will prevent pandemic are done at the national and multinational level. In our book, we actually push for something like a NATO for health. So our view is that the WHO is the wrong design as the UN was not you know, the right design for keeping the world uh, from Soviet domination in the immediate post-war period. Uh, NATO, a smaller set of countries with real muscle was necessary. Uh, and I think going forward, a smaller number of nations with real muscle uh, is necessary again as well. What that means is both obviously spending more on R&D that's related to pandemics, that's related to contagious illness, but also to have monitoring, to have real monitoring in different countries, to have the ability to lock down borders really swiftly, to have protocols, to have investigation, and probably to have deals in which Rich countries pay poor countries. So Keith was interested in rich, rich districts of the US paying poor districts. Rich countries pay poor countries both to have better monitoring and to enforce better hygienic rules, like keeping human beings away from bats or other uh, zoonotic sources of, of plague. So you know, money for Indian sewers is the payoff for making sure that you follow, follow these rules. So this kind of NATO for health is the starting point. That's gonna require real money, but it should be spending real money. I mean, this was a, you know. $20 trillion pandemic in terms of its cost. This was an amazingly costly thing. It's willing, it's worthwhile spending tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, in terms of, of below the country level, it's harder. I mean, it's cities need to make sure that they have safety, which is some part of it, right? I mean, rich people have to feel like they actually want to be in the city. We also can't treat rich people as being something to be despised. Uh, and you know they're going to cities are going to need to provide continue providing amenities that uh, rich people like, but ideally they will do so in a way that prom provides more affordable space for poor people that are near them, right? So ideally that does more to create more possibilities of mixing between rich and poor, and I think I have hard hard trouble envisioning that without a change in the approach towards uh, urban land use without policies that enable much more construction of affordable housing in areas that are close to where rich people live. I don't see how that changes. I think the current idea that I'm, I'm pushing, and I, I should have a, a op-ed in the New York Times tomorrow on this, is that the Biden infrastructure plan should be tied to land use reform. So states should not get infrastructure money unless they actually, and that's how it'll always be. That's how it always is in the US. The money is given from the feds to the states. They should not get infrastructure money unless they make tangible steps year by year. It's meant to be an eight year plan. So in the first year, that can just be a proposal from the governor. The second year, there'll need to be legislation. But in the third year, there needs to be more housing built in high income areas, in high income areas that are low density. And you don't need to require this in those states that are already poor, uh, sorry, are already low income. You need to target those places, whether or not it's New York or California or Massachusetts, that have counties that have the following three characteristics. High incomes, so rich people, high housing prices, low density, oh, I guess four characteristics, and limited levels of current construction, right? So those are your four, four things that you're looking for, right? High prices, high incomes, low density, and low construction. If you've got that, then there's room to build, and you, know, you should only be paying for the infrastructure, which after all will only be used if there are people there. You should only be paying for the infrastructure if the states are making tangible steps to allow there to be space for poor people to come close to where rich people live. Thank you very much. Uh, well, everyone, we've we've come to the end of our slot. I can see uh, Ed. You can see Jason's.
asked another quite engaging question. Um, but could I thank you very, very much for your lecture. Uh, it was very enjoyable. And to everyone here, please, um, it won't be long, we hope, before Ed's lecture will appear uh, in our journal. And uh, we will be making various media announcements when that's the case, so you can all access it and reference it. So once again, I would like to thank Ed very much. Um, uh, and I would like to thank all of you for attending. And I hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Urban Studies.